Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this meeting of the Council of the Town of Oakville. I invite everyone to rise and join Council in the singing of O Canada. Thank you. Please be seated. I'll now uh, give our opening prayer, followed by a moment of silent reflection, and uh, at that point we'll begin the meeting proper. God, grant us understanding and patience that justice, truth, and honesty may be evident in our decisions. Make us mindful of the needs of the people throughout the town of Oakville. Help us govern with the wider community in mind, and so create in us a desire for progress and responsible action. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, Madam Clerk, I understand we have regrets this evening. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have regrets from Councillors DeMoff and Elgar. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Thank you. How do you wish to deal with the minutes that are before you? Councillor Duddock moves uh, adoption of the minutes, seconded by Councillor Robinson. Any corrections? All in favor? Opposed, if any, the minutes are adopted. And that's the minutes of the regular session of Council on August 12th and the minutes of September 9th and the confidential minutes of the closed session of council on September 9th. We have no public presentations listed for this agenda and we have no delegations. Um, but we do have our regular standing committee reports and uh, council before you have the report of the community services committee meeting of September 10th and the administrative services committee meeting of September 10th and the confidential report of the closed session of the Administrative Services Committee from September 10th. Councillor Adams? Uh, I'd move them, uh, but I'd like to separate item four from the ASC agenda to make a minor correction. All right. Is there a seconder? Councillor Kahn? Thank you. All right. Um, uh, we, we're holding uh, item four, and uh, I guess we'll vote on the rest. All, any other separations? All in favor? Opposed, if any. Uh, Councillor Adams, uh, section item four. Uh, a minor correction, which is that the French Halton Public District School Board uh, should properly be named the Conseil Scolaire Viamonde. Right. So I'll give you the uh, uh, wording, but um, the French Halton Public District School Board doesn't have that name. Okay. Madam Clerk? We can approve it as corrected, and we will correct it. Yeah, Council would like to. Council would approve it as corrected. We will make that change. Okay. All right. Councillor Adams moves it as corrected, seconded by Councillor Kahn. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Council, that brings us to our discussion item, which is a holdover from another meeting on July 8th. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to uh, bring to the podium our distinguished town solicitor, Mr. Douglas Carr. And he'll inform us and the public on the many good works of our legal department. 
Mr. Carr. Mayor Burton and members of council, it is my true pleasure to have this opportunity to present to you a brief update on the town's legal department. In doing so, I hope to give you a sense of the work we do to help guide the operations of the town and support council in achieving your strategic objectives. So, why the need for in-house legal services at the town. Well, for one thing, the laws, rules, and regulations involving municipal governments are more varied and complex than ever. Consider just a sampling of relevant legislation. I had to delete many more than you see included here just to get it down to one slide. And that's a snapshot of just some of the applicable legislation, not including regulations, guidelines, provincial plans and policies, and of course, the common law of court and board decisions. But to be clear, the law is not really about a long, daunting list of different sources. The law is not what's etched in some moldy books, filled with obscure Latin phrases, lurking just out of reach on some dank and dusty shelves. No. The business of law, the everyday reality of law, grapples with how to be fair to real people, with real issues and real interests, and who have deeply held, often conflicting perspectives about what's the best outcome. Just like the business of counsel. And the law is always in flux. It's living, breathing, always subject to change and shifting interpretations. The law impacting municipalities is no different. Consider alone the signature legislation, the Municipal Act 2001. As Council is aware, municipalities have been in place in this country since even before Confederation. The Baldwin Act named after then Premier of Canada, Robert Baldwin, was passed in 1849. It established the basic municipal structure of counties, townships, villages, towns, and cities that existed in the province until January 2003, just over 10 years ago. So it's no exaggeration to say that there has been a sea change in the laws affecting municipalities in recent years. While it remains true that municipalities do not have independent constitutional status in Canada and remain creatures of the province, the legislation now expressly recognizes municipalities as responsible and accountable governments. And each municipality is given a broad range of powers and duties for the purpose of providing good government. The Municipal Act gives you, our town council, the broad authority to enable you to govern the town's affairs as you consider appropriate, including everything from regulating land use supporting economic development, licensing businesses, 
planning for transportation and energy in the community, and protecting the local environment. That broad authority is a clear direction about the continuing strong and vibrant place for municipalities in our society. And that's one thing that's never going to change. Judicial interpretation of municipal authority in the courts has also evolved from a strict constructionist shopping list approach of needing to find specific legislative authority for every action by a municipality to now one of a more broad and purposive approach and increased judicial deference for the local decision-making process. The incredible complexity of the ever-evolving statute and common law and the watershed swing towards greater authority, latitude, and deference being provided to local governments carry with it greater responsibility and also greater scrutiny. The legal department works with you and staff to navigate this change. So, who do we work with? In truth, every other department at some point talks to us. We think that's a good thing. But we also understand that it's not always true that a to-do that says must meet with lawyers is universally embraced as a hallmark of a successful and fulfilling day. Sometimes, though, meeting with us is necessary to help people through challenging or difficult situations. But we also encourage positive interaction with our staff colleagues early and often so that we are consulted when issues show up, not just when they blow up. We give the best, most informed advice we can to counsel and our fellow staff members. As advisors, it's our job to give sound interpretations that are responsive to the facts and grounded in the law. And we try as much as possible to avoid saying no. Rather than no, we always try to find a way of saying yes, but. That is, we endeavor to suggest an alternative strategy, where appropriate, to avoid potential pitfalls or to be better positioned to advance or defend down the road what is being achieved on behalf of the town. Doing it right from the beginning is always the best strategy. We are a small, tight-knit department with a combination of both full and part-time staff. As much as we can, we do the work in-house, not only for reasons of efficiency, but also to keep our own skill sets honed and to maintain internal corporate knowledge and experience. We will retain and instruct outside counsel where special expertise is required or where the demands of a complex or lengthy matter are such that we're not able to devote as many internal resources as we think are required to achieve the best chance of success. But even where we serve as instructing solicitors to outside counsel, we endeavor to do as much as possible to engage with witnesses and residents, assist with strategy and the preparation of evidence in the case of hearings, and otherwise support and manage the file internally in order to control costs and stay sharp. So what do we do? <clears throat> Frankly, there are a lot of things that the legal department does that are under the radar and simply part of the smooth functioning of the day-to-day -day operations of a local government. Not just the obvious or high-profile court and board hearings that everyone is aware of, either as lead or instructing solicitors, 
but also daily or routine legal services, just some of which are arrayed in this slide. This is just a sampling of what we do, but you can see that it represents a wide and varied gamut of issues and activities. You know, whenever I tell my sons that if they truly want an exciting and challenging career, think municipal law. I get that tolerant but almost loving eye roll that's reserved for old TV shows and clearly out of touch parents. But it is a truly challenging and rewarding place to be. I tell them, look, this is the level of government that's closest to the people, that consistently delivers the services that citizens most care about, that makes some of the toughest decisions, that is by far the most accessible, democratic, and accountable, and is the one level of government that does all that while maintaining a balanced budget. It's the culmination of the age-old principle that the level of government that's closest to the issue is the level of government that should pass the laws. Now, in that regard, Council has clearly articulated important goals in its strategic plan, including to be innovative in everything we do and to be environmentally sustainable, among many others. The legal department, along with our staff colleagues, strives to achieve your overall vision. A case in point that reflects both these goals is the province's first and only municipal health protection air quality bylaw. While it was brought forth in 2010 in the shadow of the proposed Oakville Power Generating Station, this singular bylaw continues to operate today as a viable and highly effective tool. As our colleagues in environmental policy have reported, it has resulted in the cleanest possible projects, including the new hospital, and positive, measurable improvements to our air quality. Other examples of Council's leadership in setting an innovative and independent course abound including successfully calling on the province to promptly enact new rules regarding geothermal drilling, enacting a leading edge private tree cutting bylaw, and setting tough protocols in connection with cell towers, video lottery terminals, and shark fin consumption in the community. Council has also been a front runner ahead of the province and many others on restrictions on tanning bed use by children, and before that, keeping our community and future generations safe from toxic pesticides. These are all issues, separate and apart from the day-to-day -day legal work that the legal department has actively assisted with and provided support to both council and our fellow staff members. We enjoy the challenge of trying to keep up with you. We have also taken direction from the overarching strategic goal for Oakville to be the most livable town in Canada. As instructing solicitors, we oversaw the defense of your signed bylaw to the highest courts in the country. And we continue to defend the bylaw and are vigilant for opportunities to make it stronger where appropriate in legally defensible ways. Policies and restrictions for, to prevent inappropriate drive-through uses and loss of employment lands, critical interim control bylaws, and new livable Oakville policies have all been tested and upheld. Now, can I stand here and promise you that we will always win every case that comes before the Ontario Municipal Board and other tribunals and the courts? No. I can't. But, as this council has shown, sometimes the most important thing is to take a stand. 
Council has shown that it's not afraid to make decisions that may be different from what some or even many in the community may want to hear. And when directed to defend the town's interests, we do our level best to deliver the results you seek. And if we don't think those results are attainable, we let you know as soon and as frankly as possible. Mayor Burton, under the direction of council, in my judgment, Oakville has developed a solid reputation for being tough, but not frivolous, with its appeals to the Ontario Municipal Board and involvement in the courts. If we are there to defend council's decisions, it is because it genuinely does matter deeply to the community and is recognized as such by the courts and various tribunals. Now I've mentioned the power plant, which continues to be a matter of public debate, and I obviously have no comment on that. But it does bear highlighting this council's role and direction to staff right from the outset, indeed well before the proposed Oakville location was announced, to hold proponents, the regulatory bodies, and the decision-making and approval processes to clear, transparent, evidence-based standards to safeguard public health and safety in the town. And what may have been forgotten is that this insistence by Council of do no harm to the community and adherence to fundamental principles and processes of sound land use planning, which was upheld as appropriate and fully justified by the Ontario Municipal Board, resulted in a combined total of 11 Municipal Board and Court challenges to the town's position. 2009 and 2010 were years I will never forget. With a special tip of the hat to Monday, March the 29th, 2010, a day we were served with three separate legal proceedings, two Ontario Municipal Board and one court challenge. The last OMB appeal listed as number seven on the chart is the appeal to the town's policies and regulations regarding power generating facilities throughout the community that were developed following over a year of active study, involving public and stakeholder consultation and a comprehensive analysis using both in-house and subject matter experts of energy generation technologies, environmental impacts, risk analysis, and appropriate land use policies. Those policies and regulations were adopted by Council almost six months before the expiry of the interim control bylaw that was passed to enable that work to be conducted. The appeal to those policies and regulations was launched almost three weeks after the Oakville power plant project was cancelled by the province. Now, with the slate clear and the town eventually recovering almost half a million dollars in legal costs, I do look back with some pride that we were able to help steer a firm course through these turbulent seas that was true to council's stewardship on this most challenging of issues. We hope that our track record has led council to be confident in the legal advice and resources we've been able to bring to bear and direct over the years in the service of Council's goals and strategic plans and in the support and defense of your decisions. Much important work lies ahead, including the Downtown Cultural Hub Project, the South Central Public Land Study, the development of surplus school sites acquired by the town, new accessibility standards, the new hospital, and of course, the town's new comprehensive zoning bylaw 
coming forward to implement your approved livable Oakville policies, to name just a few. You may be assured that behind the scenes, we are working diligently in both small and more significant ways to assist our staff colleagues and to support and implement your strategic work plan in accordance with the direction you set and the decisions you make. And trust is symbiotic. It works both ways. Whether we are enforcing a bylaw in the courts, drafting an agreement, conducting a real estate transaction, filing an appeal, or negotiating a resolution, we have full confidence that Council is standing behind us because you know that we are seeking to achieve what matters to the town on your behalf. Mayor Burton, my client, our department's client, is no one member of staff or member of council. My client, our department's client, is the municipal corporation of the town of Oakville. And council, acting as a whole in accordance with the rules you set for yourself and applicable law, is the directing mind of that corporation. By extension then, council is my client. In fact, the Law Society of Upper Canada, the governing body for the legal profession in Ontario, does not permit us to act for or represent anyone else except the town. And in that solicitor-client relationship, a relationship we are duty-bound by our profession to safeguard and is respected by every court. In that relationship, sometimes it's our job to serve as a fervid advocate. Other times, to provide the whispered voice of calm and reason. And still others, as the steady hand on the tiller that helps to stay the course in keeping with the instructions you give. In doing so, we seek to maintain a proud tradition in our department of expertise in service of the town and strive throughout to be true to the example of dedicated public service set by my two distinguished predecessors, Doug Gates and Cliff Demeray. In doing so, I want to sincerely thank Council for the steadfast support the legal team has received over the years. And allow me to assure you that we will continue to be vigilant to maintain your trust and work hard as your solicitors on your behalf in addressing the challenges and opportunities ahead. Mayor Burton and members of Council, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Carr, for that spirited uh, explication of your service to the town. Council, do you have questions? Councillor Noel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Carr. See, I, I, I see how old I am. It's um, an honor. The, uh, you, you concluded, first of all, excellent presentation. You concluded with a comment about uh, looking forward to the future challenges and that sort of thing. What do you anticipate as being the... the, the next few major challenges from a legal perspective that we're going to have to or you're going to have to deal with in terms of legislation changes or anything on the horizon that, that uh, uh, we should be keeping our minds on right now? I think that uh, through you, uh, Mayor Burton, the, uh, the Municipal Act is always a, a source of uh, observation and, and change by the province, but I think also there, continuing, there continue to be uh, new rules regarding municipal elections that are coming down the pipe that we have to be vigilant in watching for. And uh, municipal conflict of interest is so much in the press that I would not at all be surprised if the province makes uh, some initiatives in that regard. Are we expecting changes to the Municipal Elections Act before 2014? I understand that there may be some minor changes in the works, yes. Interesting, okay. 
Thank you very much we'll, for the presentation. We'll keep you advised. Yeah, obviously you will. Yeah. We know that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Other questions? Councillor Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Carr. When you said um, that uh, municipal law is really exciting, you said it with such conviction and passion, you almost sounded like a litigator. <laughs> uh, just two questions. One is, if you can go back to that uh, circle that you had the different tasks, they said charter arguments, motions, trials. No, no, I can manage it, I think. So in the private sector, you'll have different lawyers acting on different areas of law. For example, someone will be doing you know, corporate law, someone will be doing tax law. Are all of our lawyers practicing in all these areas, or are we, do we have people that are specialized within our department that are the go-to person every time one of these situations arises? Through you, uh, Mayor Burton, we are a fairly small department, so we all end up uh, chipping in um, on all of these things, although over time, uh, if you work on something once, you, you are recognized as the expert on that. Um, we have a municipal prosecutor on staff who handles the, um, the parking tickets and um, all of the Provincial Offenses Act matters. We have a realty services section that deals with the appraisal of properties um, and land evaluations. Um, we have a part-time um, real estate lawyer who handles our real estate transactions. Um, another part-time lawyer who over time has uh, specialized in contract law um, and uh, both of the uh, assistant town solicitors uh, will support uh, the planning department and, and other departments. So basically we all chip in. And, and the other question I'm going to ask, it's a bit more concerning about the 1% the rule. How has that affected our insurance premiums uh, going through tort law, where um, the municipality, even if they're found 1% one, 1 liable, they can bear the entire cost of the damages award? I understand that some municipalities have been facing uh, crushing insurance premiums. Has that affected our, our municipality? Um, I, I'm not aware of um, any uh, decision, <clears throat> sorry, um, of any decision where we um, are subject to uh, such a crushing award, but that does remain to be the, the case that for municipalities, if they're 1% liable, then um, if the other, um, I don't want to say guilty party, the other uh, party that's responsible for the injury um, doesn't have the resources, then the next uh, party to look to, obviously, is the one with deep pockets, which is the municipality. I think the only response to that would be uh, an amendment to the Negligence Act. Thank you, Councillor. As in fact, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario has long been lobbying for, and the lack of result from the provincial government, I think, speaks volumes on that point. Councillor Knoll, uh, again. Thanks. I, I had forgotten one of the points, and Councillor Kahn's question reminded me that that chart that you showed, can you put it back up for a second? The, um, the explosion <laughs> of, of issues? I can't remember the term, but in, in, the, in the web world, the um, uh, search, um, search engines generally will generate, what's the term? Is, is that the correct, sorry. You may be thinking about word, word cloud. Word cloud, yeah. Does, is, this, is this a word cloud, or is, does do, do the size of these various issues reflect your workload, or is this no. just, just, just stylistic? It's stylistic. In fact, if you look, there's really tiny print that says expropriation well, proceedings, and biting yeah. dogs is, is large. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's a stylistic. So what would, what would the number one uh, development issues, I assume? Would that, yeah? Yes. Okay. And where would trials fit, since that's the biggest? Where would that fit in the, in the workload? Our prosecutor um, is with our department three days of the week and with parking two days of the week. Um, and the, the trouble with trials is the uh, limited resources that are available to us. Um, and um, there are trial dates now that are being set months and months down the road and, and in danger of uh, charter challenges for delay. Um, so we, we are in trials at least once or twice a month. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Councillor. And Mr. Carr, maybe you could just expand on that to help the public understand it better. By limited resources, I think you mean, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but just explain how we're limited to 
one or two day, court dates, and the resources that are short, you know, the lim limitation on resources is what we have available from the province. Can you just yeah, that, That's exactly that? right. We share uh, court resources with uh, the other municipalities of the region. And uh, no matter how many charges you lay or how long your docket is, each municipality is only provided one or two days a month to litigate those matters. And when those days quickly get filled up, then you're looking at trial dates, as I say, many months down the road, and that it does not serve uh, justice. Thank you very much for that additional uh, information. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Council, can we have a mover and secondary receive the report? Councilor Knoll, Councilor Grant, all in favor? Opposed? That's adopted. Council, we have no confidential discussion items, and you have your information items previously circulated electronically, and you have your status of outstanding issues. And that brings us to new business. I, I know of no notice of motion, but is there any emergency, congratulatory or condolence matter before us? Thank you. Um, are there any regional reports or questions uh, regarding town boards and advisory committees? Uh, we have council two requests for reports. Um, one uh, moved by Councillor Duddick and seconded by Councillor Robinson, uh, asking staff consult with the police service to uh, provide a report on potential amendments to applicable town bylaws to prohibit individuals from urinating on public property within the town. Um, the, uh, uh, the matter is before you. Uh, uh, may I call the vote? All those in favor of this report? Opposed? That, that report is approved. The request is approved. The second one is uh, a request by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Robinson, for a report on mitigating the impacts of drive test locations in town from residential areas. Um, I'll put the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that request is approved also. Are there any other requests for reports? Then could we have a, perhaps a mover and seconder for consideration reading of the bylaws? Councillor Knoll again, seconded by Councillor Giddings, thank you. Um, this would be for bylaws 2013-57, 82, 84, and 89, the confirmatory bylaw. All in favor? Opposed? I think that carried. All in favor? Oh, it does carry. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been great working with you, and uh, that concludes our agenda. We are adjourned.